Hello, David. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Good morning, really Sonia. Great to be here. Good to see you. Great to see you. David Thunder, as I said, has been with us before. He's a polit political philosopher, but he's so much more than that. I love David's The Freedom blog. David just cuts through the nonsense. Absolutely do, David. And I absolutely appreciate you for that. If anybody's not familiar, please do find The Freedom blog. David is on Twitter. But David, you have you are finally back on Twitter after being banned from a rather extensive period. Why were you banned? I was banned for basically discussing um, the use of ivermectin in the treatment of COVID um, in Mexico and India. I, I mentioned that it was being used uh, as, a, as a treatment method. And also because I questioned the wisdom of vaccinating healthy uh, young adults. That was enough to get me kicked off Twitter, Twitter 1.0. But we're now in Twitter 2.0. So uh, now there's actually the ability to uh, discuss issues freely. And so, you know, credit, credit is due to Elon Musk for putting this, pulling it off. As an observer of these things and a commentator, how important do you think Twitter is to the public discourse? I think Twitter is incredibly important to the public discourse because not only because it's the most dominant um, discussion platform, digital discussion platform in the world, um, but also because basically um, its influence is disproportionate to the number of people who use it. That is to say, we know that a minority of the population is on Twitter, but who is on Twitter? <clears throat> Public leaders, politicians, influencers, cultural opinion leaders, journalists, and so on, academics. Um, so, uh, so in a sense, you could say that it is um, the place to be, you might say, for um, participating in the global public sphere. And so when you get removed from Twitter, that could be a negative way of looking at it. What does that imply, getting kicked off Twitter? It really does remove your access to the media mm. in many ways because mm. you're not on the radar screen anymore. Now, what you're here to discuss, I think, is so vital at this moment in time. People are in despair, David. I don't need to tell you this. People are like, we've tried this, we've tried this. What can we do to, you know, to change? So what you're going to talk about is basically going from negative to positive from the sort of you know, in terms of the COVID protest movement. So, David, how do we make that leap? Because we're all sort of mired in this mud at this moment in time, trying to work out how to get move forward. Yes, I, uh, this is the issue, really. Um, there are two dangers that I see with the COVID protest movement, let's call it, the, the, you know. One is that it could run out of steam. Right. Because indignation and anger um, can be very powerful, but you can't keep them up for a decade, for two decades, um, you know, they, it becomes tiring after a while and it's not sustainable no. to, uh, to be driven simply by indignation um, all the time and by a negative critique. Um, so it could run out, run out of steam. And the other danger is that uh, we could lose, let's say, a kind of middle ground. We could lose people who are not preoccupied with <clears throat> COVID measures who maybe are vaguely aware that the vaccines could have some problems, but they're not into the vaccine debate. Um, maybe they don't have loved ones who suffered from vaccine injury. You know, maybe they're not affected. Uh, maybe they don't understand the nature of the debate. And many people have commented to me, several people, <clears throat> that, you know, um, sort of along the lines of, can we talk about something other than COVID and vaccines? So. I think this is where negative to positive comes in. It's so important that we show people that there is a positive vision of freedom, of the free society behind all of these protests. And, and then the issue becomes, well, first, how do we, how do we articulate that vision? Right. Um, we need to articulate it. And second, we need to find a way to institutionalize it, to make it a sustainable part of our community life um, from the grass at the grassroots level. And I know there are efforts to, you know, to uh, build community organizations that are conscious of their liberties and are trying to build something positive, whether it be in healthcare or in education or, or in even leisure or culture. Um, but, but I think it is important to uh, sort of build something positive 
Um, and that's why I use the word institutionalized because uh, it, it, it's a bad word for some people, some people's ears, institutionalized. It sounds like making yeah. it kind of very stiff yeah. and boring. But really what I mean is simply the idea that it would have the kind of sustainability that an institution can have over time because it's basically certain customs, certain rules, certain agreements, a, collect, a shared narrative that help a movement to kind of remain stable over time rather than just become go the way of Occupy Wall Street or the right, Arab Spring right, or you. some of these other movements we've seen just peter out. Yes, absolutely. And the thing is, we're talking about a huge body of people who are desperate to do something with this gathering that has happened. Because obviously people are just you sort of magnetically being attracted to others of like mind. And so we do need that from, as you say, there are groups that have set up. But how would we go about this on a sort of day to day level? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think I'd say that there are um, maybe two different levels. One level is at the level of, say, um, coordinating with other groups um, in other parts of the world or in other parts of the country to just get ideas and to kind of be inspired. And that's wh where the World Wide Web comes in. That's where Twitter comes in. And, um, you know, I think there was a COVID kind of summit in Portugal um you know a while back bringing together people who are basically very concerned about their freedoms being in jeopardy um so that they can together and one-on-one -on -one, ideally i mean well at least in person be able to articulate that vision together and inspire each other um, and then to get to the what you what you're talking about which is the day-to-day -day, when you come back from those gatherings when you come yes. back Yes. with that information and that inspiration then the next thing to do is to to look around you and to kind of think okay um what is uh, who are my allies who are the people who i can count on um who i can influence who i can talk to and and maybe uh, learn from as well who who live in my vicinity in my neighborhood or in my city um and what sorts of problems do we face together that we might help to address? Um, and so there's no, there's no quick fix solution to this. I mean, no. it's very clear. No. Absolutely not. There's, it's, it's about discernment, you know, it's actually to do with discernment because we have to look into our hearts and we have to say, what am I, what have I got in a way? What are my talents and um, what are my friend's talents? And can we put these together and build something worthwhile? Um, and I'll just give you one, one example from the healthcare sector. Some friends of mine in America, in the United States, um, basically were talking about the really pr the problem of healthcare insurance, health insurance in the United States, which is skyrocketing, very expensive, very litigious. Um, the costs of healthcare are just extremely high. And so basically um, a Christian charitable organization had launched uh, an insurance scheme um, for like-minded people. So people who basically, they didn't necessarily have to be Christian, but I think they had to make some commitments, lifestyle commitments in order to enter into the insurance scheme, which would then keep the costs down. Um, and so they had a number of things like paying cash up front to the doctor and then the doctor would accept a discount if he gets cash up front. Um, it was a very interesting scheme, maybe 100,000 people in it. But I know personally friends who are in that scheme and who have brought down their healthcare costs by entering into that scheme. Wow. So, you know, that's a civil society initiative, a creative initiative that actually addresses a pragmatic problem, namely the, the cost of health insurance. Yeah. And I'm sure people could think of lots of other examples, you know, but it really is a question of imagination, creativity you know, and, and initiative. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing is, is that I, I think both of both you and I are in agreement about the importance of a Twitter, but equally the outrage that is galvanized on there often overshadows anything else because people just get so, t it can be something, Andrew Bridgen, obviously this week and his Holocaust, what well, not his comment, but repeating somebody else's comment, the outrage that that creates and what it, what it tends to do in my opinion is it, it generates something else and distracts you from what we're really dealing with. So again, how do we, 
I don't know. How do we fight against these distractions? It's so hard when you're on social media not to get caught up in that whirlwind. What happens is you might say you, you're, you can be distracted from reality, the reality that is non-virtual, that is in front of your face, in front of your eyes. Now, whether it be your own family, your immediate friends, your workplace, and you could be living this parallel life online where you get, you know, you're, you, you get, uh, you experience indignation, you feel this is, you know, you feel righteous anger about all of these issues going on in the world and you express it on your screen, you know, and you, you, you express all of your feelings there. And, you know, ironically, that can have a domesticating effect because if we pour our energies into indignation on, on social media, we may have very little energy left to actually transform our environment. It's a very good and point. And to, you know, undertake actual constructive battles and also presence of mind and um, inner freedom and inner peace. Um, it's so important to be recollected on the inside in order to make that discernment of how I can contribute to society. Um, because if I'm too scattered and I'm just going down my scrolling down the news right, and, oh, this right. is terrible, I'll retweet it. This is, I like this, I'll retweet this, I like this, I'll comment this. Um, then what happens is you, you, you can, your brain is actually kind of being rewired a little bit. You know, there's, you know, people have studied for sure, this. For sure, for sure. So and you can become less able to be present, fully uh, present. A hundred percent. And the thing is, I don't know about you, but I mean, I've been around campaigns and activism for an awful long time I'm involved in them and I have often found that some people who are raging at the world have a hell of a personal life like their life is falling apart and it's like I'm very much of the mind that take care of your corner and then you can branch out but you have to you have to start with you and yours first and then you can take care of the rest of the world I used to do that same thing I used to distract from the mess in my life and go, you know, bloody Tories, la, 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 la. But what, what's the point when you haven't got your own stuff together? I think you're absolutely right. And it does deplete you. Social media yeah. does deplete you. Um, you can have the kind of feel-good factor when, when you're sending out a, a, a tweet and you see it's been retweeted 100 times. Right. Or, or even, you know, on a, on a very good day, maybe it gets up to 500 or 1,000 retweets. Um, but, but, and you might feel, wow, you get that little bit of uh, dopamine rush when you see the influence you're having, it's kind of in the digital sphere, but then, you know, we should step back from that and ask ourselves, first of all, how pervasive and lasting is that influence you've had? How deep is it? And Ooh. second of all, um, Ooh. you know, in my personal life, what, 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 how is my way of life, my my state of character, my dispositions towards others, my friendships, how do they mark other people? Um, because in a way, I think we should have faith in the fact that how we live in the here and now can shape other people and can have a good influence on, on our environment. Um, and okay, we're not Barack Obama or we're not, uh, you know, Biden, we're not able to influence the world in the way they can in a big, big, large scale way, maybe. But why do we underestimate, underestimate, undervalue so much the influence we have in our immediate sphere? I think this might be a consequence of, you know, the kind of the world of big media and social media that it encourages us to think about change in global terms. Yes. And uh, yes. because it is a global, after all, it is a global public sphere. So, I mean, you know, what's happening to an MP in England and people mistreating him or mischaracterizing his statements, that's important, it's part of the public sphere. But, uh, but there's also things going on in my life, the life of my family, my wife, my little baby, uh, you know, everything going on around me, that I should, my workplace, you know, I should think about how I can invest, it, invest there. I mean, it sounds so obvious to say this, but... But it's I necessary. Sort of think... What you're saying, yeah, yeah. it might, it is, it does sound so obvious, but the fact is, I think people have forgotten this. 
Uh, you know, I, I, I do think that social media is an awful lot to answer for. It is brilliant, can bring us together. I wouldn't have known about you, for example, were it not for social media. There's lots of brilliant things, but I'm now, I spend very little time on social media. I, I saw this brilliant quote and it changed my entire perspective. And that is be a producer, not a consumer on social media. And I just changed every, the way I looked at it completely. I don't, I hardly ever scroll anymore because I just found it so depleting and draining because, you know, it's like, what can we do? What can we do? But what I, I think what you're saying is so positive and so uplifting. And it, of course, we can't get a change overnight, but we can make a change. Yeah, so we could just pick pick some issues in which some areas in which I know that I can make some kind of valid contribution, valuable contribution. And even if it's something modest, um, you know, I can I can help in my community. I can help improve my workplace in some way. I can make a suggestion to my boss to, you know, to restructure something in, in my workplace um, or, you know, or to accommodate some need that's important of some employee um, or to defend a fellow employee who needs to be defended. Right. Um, you know, um, there's so many little things we can do. And um, which, which yeah, adds so, to the whole. Yeah, exactly. So holism, that's it, really. I think it's kind of to aim for a more integrated, holistic way of life in which you don't have completely, you know, you're living in this parallel universe of Twitter and then your own life, you're sort of blah. Right. You know, you should be right. you should be fighting the battles of freedom and in a good way and, uh, you know, trying to vindicate people's rights and trying to help people live, you know, better lives and happier lives um, outside Twitter. I would say more than in Twitter. Um, and so Twitter should be more like a background thing. Yes. And then the life should be the foreground. Absolutely. What a beautiful note to end on everybody. David Thunder, political philosopher at University of Navarra.